Hello everyone, this is the second in a series of lectures covering chapter 38. Today we'll be talking about Rayleigh's criterion and the diffraction resolution limit. Optical systems uh, can observe images, but given the fact that what they're observing, that light must pass through some aperture or some, some slit, the image then is at least somewhat diffracted. There's, there's a bit of a diffraction pattern, which is what you actually see through a telescope. Now for a, for a single object you're observing, where you look at this like big bright fringe surrounded by smaller fringes, but overall, most of the object's lights will be centered in the, in the main uh, maxima in the middle. So, the effect won't stop you from observing the source. But if you're viewing two sources, so perhaps you're looking at a binary system with your telescope, it can happen that due to their light coming in to your optics and both sources creating this diffraction pattern, um, what you end up seeing is a superposition of the pattern of both sources. And if the sources are spaced close together, then what you end up seeing is a superposition of their diffraction patterns where you can't really tell which is which. So in figure A, we see that the two sources, maybe two stars at a big enough angle that the light that you get to see their, their diffraction pattern on your telescope still lets you tell them apart since the main fringe of the second source is farther apart from the main fringe of the first. So you will be able to see in your telescope two red images close to each other. Now, in the second case, the sources are much closer together. And since we are looking at them, you know, from, from the earth, uh, we can't know exactly physically what the distance is, but we can measure their angular distance. So in this case, their angular distance is smaller. And that means that they sort of fall uh, near the same spot on your optics. And this means that the what they project, their diffraction patterns are now a lot closer together. And so this overlap makes it really hard to, to resolve them since your image just looks like a kind of like a combined, uh, like two combined bright spots. There is a condition that determines at what angular separation you can actually resolve images. And that's Rayleigh's criterion. So the smallest angle uh, that you can observe two sources and still be able to resolve them um, is whichever angular separation that makes the uh, central maximum of one image uh, fall on the first minimum of the other image. And that condition is Rayleigh's criterion. So as you can see in the figure A, the central maximum of the blue image is here, far away from the central maximum of the red image. So this is fine, right? This is this is angle is much bigger than the uh, limiting angle. But in figure B, though, you see that we are way below Rayleigh's criterion because the maximum of this angle, of the maximum of this, sorry, of the of the pattern of the first source here, this red pattern is right over, it's getting real close to the maximum of the second source. So it's a little past, it's a little past its first, uh, its first minimum. So in this case, the images are so close together, we can't resolve them. So for astronomers, effective diffraction 
make it hard to resolve images, especially when you're looking at binary systems or solar systems. The Rayleigh's criterion actually sets down some ground rules to determine the minimum angle you need to resolve two images in, in your device, in your setup. For a single slit diffraction, the limiting angle uh, is based on the position of the first minimum of the first dark fringe of a diffraction pattern. Um, since if there's another pattern, then if it's at an angle with that smaller than the angular position of the first pattern's dark fringe, it'll mean that they're close together and that they'll, they'll be overlapping. So it, then for the assumption that the wavelength lambda is much smaller than the size of the slit, we can approximate sine theta to just theta. And so the, the minimum angle possible to, to resolve two images is the ratio of the wavelength over the size of the slit. So again, because this is the angle again, this is the angle at which um, the the minimum, the first minima of one object will overlap with the central maxima with the central fringe of the second object. And any angle smaller than this one, um, they will all overlap further. And then if the angle decreases between the two sources, eventually the two fringes are overlapping. For a circular aperture like those in telescopes, the limiting angle is a little bit different. Um, so it's still a function of the wavelength of light. So the shorter the wave, the better the resolution in theory. That means that uh, resolving gamma rays and x-rays is a lot easier than resolving microwaves and radio waves. The Factor here uh, of 1.22 basically comes from some math analysis of how diffraction works in a circular aperture, which is a bit more complex than a slit. And D here is for the diameter of the aperture, so how big is the camera and the telescope. So you can see how for telescopes that study long radiation like infrared or radio waves, you're going to have to have a big aperture um, if you want to have a good resolution limit. The figures at the bottom just kind of show you how um, what you might see if you're stargazing with a telescope. And in the case of figure A, you're seeing light from two stars that you know are far enough away that you can still tell them apart, right? They're, the way that they appear in your telescope is at this sort of circular diffraction patterns, but their central fringes are far away from each other. And the central fringes kind of represent most of the image anyways. So you can clearly tell them apart. You can clearly tell where they are. Um, but then if the stars are closer together, like in figure B, um, then they're at the point that just satisfies the Rayleigh criterion. Then as you can see here, the, the blue, uh, the blue star, the diffraction pattern, its minimum is right here where the red star's diffraction pattern has its ends, its uh, central maxima. So at this point, if you look at the superposition of them, you can still tell um, that there's you know some central fringe here and central fringe there. So, you know, two central fringes will mean that, okay, there's two diffractions going on. They're okay, so it can still DC two sources. But if the angular separation is, is past this limit, if we're below the threshold, then the sources are so close together that we will just see their superposition and it will look like a single source. So you can imagine then that uh, a lot of uh, moons and asteroids were not, able to be detected with historical telescopes 
until the improvements in optics made them easier to resolve. Quick quiz. Uh, eyes, young cats are um, have these pupils that are more, mostly vertical. So at nighttime, will a cat have an easier time resolving headlights or vertical lights on a boat? So your the, the limit, your solution limit, if you count the pupils of a cat as a slit, your limit uh, improves as the size of the slit increases. So increasing A uh, decreases the minimum angle possible. So it's easier to resolve stuff with a lower minimum, ang minimum angle. And the, the slits are vertical, so there's more of a vertical width than a horizontal one, which means that vertically speaking, the cats can resolve light better. So B would be the answer since those lights are vertical. Okay, another quick quiz. Suppose you're observing a binary star with a telescope and yeah, can't resolve the two stars. So you put on a color filter to maximize the resolution. Which one do you use? So a color filter um, by its name essentially blocks off any other color but the one it's made for. So a blue filter would only let blue light pass through. If you look at the minimum resolution for a telescope, the minimum angle decreases, so the resolution is improved by decreasing the minimum angle. The resolution is improved then by decreasing lambda. The, the color filters allow you to sort of just have a single particular wavelength uh, going into the telescope. So there's no uh, piling on of different colors. You can just have like a one wavelength. So we should pick the smallest one the smallest lambda so that we can have the smallest uh, resolution. In that case, if you look at all the options, the shorter light is blue, so we pick blue. So here's an example from the textbook, um, just asking about the resolution of the human eye and you're treating it as a, well, a circular aperture, which is true. For for you know the average visible light of 500 nanometers, and it seems that the resolution of the average human eye is one minute of an arc. So we can resolve objects um, that are one sixtieth of a degree apart or farther, which is pretty good. So if we know then our minimum resolution angle. we can then, at any distance from our eyes, we can determine what's the smallest separation of objects that we can distinguish. So let's say that there's two objects um, 25 centimeters from our eyes. What are, what's, what's the smallest separation for us to still tell them apart? So you know, how close do two marbles have to be 25 centimeters in front of our face before we can uh, tell them apart? And since, since you know your minimum angle, you know the, the distance, then you can just do some trigonometry. You can say that, well, the sine of the angle would give you the distance and the, the, and the length. But for, for, small, small, for a small angle, which is the case, you can just get rid of the sine term. You just have like the, the angle, approximately the ratio of d over l. You can also think of this as, as an arc length. So um, a radius of L, you know, subtends an arc of size D with an angle theta min. And that's how you get the formula there that D is equal to L theta min, it's like an arc length. And you plug it in and you see that the minimum distance is the less than a millimeter. So things that we really, really close together before they overlap for the for vision. If you're watching your friend on the other side of the football stadium, 
then you think about okay, how can I recognize them? Well, let's just say, can I see? Can I see their eyes? Can I see their nose from that distance? So let's say that the average feature is like three centimeters, and suppose that the person must be around 120 meters away. So there, there's an angle there. There's an angle that gets subtended between their face and the distance you are of about two and a half, two and a half, uh, ten to negative four radians. So this, this is a tiny, tiny angle subtended by the person uh, when they're 120 meters away from you, and uh, your minimal angle is about 10 to negative four radians. So this angle that the face subtends is is really small. So you probably won't be able to to see their face from that far away. Now, if they were closer though, if they were closer though than the the subtended angle would be a lot bigger and you'd be able to see them, of course. So the Keiko Observatory in Hawaii uh, has two telescopes that are designed to look at the infrared and visible range of light. Their diameter, their aperture is effectively uh, 10 meters. So if you're trying to look at visible in the light, um, something around like the, the red range, What's the uh, limiting angle of our solution? Well, with the formula, we plug in what we know. We know the diameter is 10. We know the wavelength is uh, 600 nanometers. And we get, uh, the answer, by the way, is always in going to be in radians, which um, as astronomers, we like to convert that to seconds of arc because um, the, the seconds of arc system is easier to visualize on a circle, especially for astronomers. Let's look at another telescope though. This one is a radio telescope, the Arecibo in Puerto Rico, which unfortunately had a beam collapse on top of it at the end of 2020. Uh, this being a radio telescope, uh, they're designed for waves with a much bigger wavelength than Keck needs. So, Imagine radio waves of three quarters of a meter in wavelength. The minimum resolution then, right, to be reasonable means that you need to have a pretty big telescope. In their case, the aperture of a telescope, uh, their diameter is 305 meters. So to give you an idea, 305 meters is uh, about four football fields put together. So if you find the resolution for this telescope, it's 10 minutes of arc. Which is about um, one, of, one, one in 36 degrees. Compare that to the Keck telescope. The Arecibo telescope is much, much, much uh, coarse. It has worse resolution than the Arecibo one. So the other way around, the Arecibo one has a has worse resolution than the Keck telescope. That said, though, uh, ground-based telescopes don't really are not so much limited by the Rayleigh criterion as they are by atmospheric blurring. So, light from space passing through the atmosphere and interactions with air basically blurs the image and. The effective resolution then of these telescopes is actually uh, worse than what's predicted by the limiting angle. In other words, a telescope can never reach its diffraction limit. And most telescopes on the ground, uh, their actual limit is about a second of an arc. It's never going to be smaller than, say, a tenth of an arc for sure. 
But basically, this is a fault of atmospheric blurring caused by variations in index of refraction with temperature variations in air, which is why orbiting telescopes are better since they're above the atmosphere and they don't suffer from atmospheric blurring. In figure A, we show uh, an image of Pluto and a little bump on the left, which is Charon. That's its moon. And due to atmospheric turbulence, so they would have, if you just look at the diffraction limiting um, angle, they, they have a good enough resolution based on that to resolve the moon and Pluto. But due to atmospheric turbulence, the image of the moon becomes like a buff bump on the edge of the image of Pluto. Now, with the Hubble Space Telescope, which is uh, out in space, that takes a picture of Pluto and Charon, and you can clearly see them nicely spaced apart, easily resolved. There's some tricks to dealing with atmospheric blurring. There's materials called adaptive optics that kind of combines computer analysis with uh, more optical elements to kind of filter and improve the image. So you can kind of simulate the atmosphere fair and kind of like remove that by accounting for how in simulations air will affect an image. And with those improvements, actually, I think the Keck telescope normally having a limited resolution of one second of arc has been improved to 30 to 60 milliseconds of arc. So it's about a factor of 20 in improvement. Now, remember the uh, marching band example we had in the first slide? So, why was it that the brass instruments couldn't really couldn't really be heard, but the clarinets and the woodwinds could? So this is because of a diffraction of sound waves. Basically, if you look at the brass instruments, like the trumpet or the trombone, they always have this like the exits. Sound comes out of this like bell-shaped end, and it's a really big opening, which only causes a small amount of diffraction. So it's not really a point source for the sound waves. It's not sound waves fan out in all directions. These mostly get funneled through just in the same direction as the opening. There's not a lot of rippling going on in all directions. It's concentrated right in front of the marcher. But for the woodwinds and the clarinets, uh, the, the the sound exits from these like tone holes along the instrument around these like big bells. So there are a bunch of different holes where the sound comes out of, and they are much smaller than the open bell ends of the brass instrument. So there is significant diffraction happening in clarinets and saxophones and woodwinds, since their sounds coming from these small holes. So the sound gets diffracted there and it moves in all directions, even backwards. So as the marching band moves away from you, the brass players are basically channeling their sound forwards. There isn't much diffraction, so you don't get to hear them that well. But the woodwind players, as they march away from you, their sound's getting diffracted in all directions, so you get to hear them even as they march away from you. Okay, that's it for chapter 38.3. Hope you join me next time where we'll be talking about the diffraction grading.